Extra Worker's Window, Chapter 6, Part 1. Chris stood for a moment before the closed door of Mr. Wicker's study. His head was still in the story of Becky Boozer's hat, where he might have glimpsed the room beside him, for the passage stopped at this point. Beyond the passage lay the glimly glimmering shop with its bow window at the far end, and the door to the street beside it. He might have been able, had he not been so intent on Becky's story, to slip past the dusty bales and cases and out into... What? But Chris's head was ringing with Ned Cilia's tale, and with all the things, so different and so absorbing, that surrounded him. He put out his hand, knocked, and on hearing a low reply stepped inside. The room Chris entered, his eyes round in order to take in every new sight, was a small study. It stretched across the back of the house. The kitchen fireplace has its echo in a fireplace on this side of the wall, and face Chris's three windows looked out, out onto the pleaged air and apple trees, the oiled rows of a vegetable and herb garden. A final window at the end of the room at Chris's left look out, out on a little hill behind the house. Chris, without thinking, stepped forward a pace or two in order to look for the familiar ugly red and gray church at the end of Church Lane. It was not to be seen. There was only a pasture hemmed by woods and fine trees with, with in the distance where M Street should be, a roof or two. A thin voice that came from nowhere and was everywhere broke into Chris. No, my boy, the church was not built as not yet built. That will come in seventy years, in eighteen sixty, to put it for Miss Fad's act. Confusing, is it not? Chris ripped about at the sound of the antiquarian's voice for a moment longer he could not see him, and looked toward the other end of the room with interest. Mr. Wicker's study was cozy and bright, well warmed by a cheerful, burning fire. The heavy curtains, drawn back now from the windows to let in the morning sun, were of a fine ruby damask. The furniture consisted, as far as Chris was concerned, of antiques. Two wing chairs covered in red leather, tacked at the edges with brass-headed nails, looked invitingly comfortable. One had its back to Chris in the door, and the other was empty. Both were drawn close to the snapping logs. A grandfather clock stood in the corner between the fireplace and the first window, and gave out a steady deep tonk tonk. Uh, uh. The carpet was of soft Indian rug of fine texture in many colors, red, blue, and gold predominating. Most surprisingly, a, st a steep spiral staircase of polished wood came down into the room in the red right hand corner near where Chris stood, and Chris wondered for a moment if Mr. Wicker's voice had come from the top of the stair. Turning back, he saw that a desk opposite him stood between the two windows that faced the garden. It seemed very old-fashioned to Chris. No neat folded writing paper, but large, bold sheets covered in Mr. Wicker's delicate handwriting lay on the open top, with several goose-quill pens standing at the back like a pen holder. Chris noticed prints of sailing ships on the walls, and candlesticks holding candles and candle snuffers on the desk, table, and mantelpiece. A closed cupboard with carved doors stood at the far end of the room. Once again, Chris turned back to look for Mr. Wicker, and to his astonishment now saw him in the chair he had thought empty a moment before. Mr. Wicker, his elbows on the arms of the chair and his fingertips touched lightly together, was watching Chris with interest and amusement. When the boy caught sight of him, Mr. Wicker nodded, smiling, and motioned Chris toward the other leather chair across from him. "'Good morning, my boy.' said the old man. I trust you slept well. Chris slowly let himself down into the offered chair. Oh, yes, thank you, sir, he replied. I don't even know how I got to into bed. Mr. Wicker made a sound that seemed to indicate it did not matter. And breakfast, Mr. Wicker asked. Becky fed you? Yes, sir, and Mr. Siley, he fed me too. Indeed. Mr. Grew's eyebrows went up to an inverted V above his dark eyes. Ned Siley so early. Well, he is a loyal soul, is Siley. You shall know more of him. He fell silent, observing the boy sitting on the edge of the big chair. Mr. Worker looked 
as if casually at the clothes Chris now wore and which fitted him as though made to his measure. What he saw seemed to please the old man, for he nodded his bald head and his wrinkles multiplied themselves across his face in a way Chris took to be his smile. At last he spoke again, and his voice was strangely gentle and kind, so kind that the forlornness Chris had momentarily forgotten is the mystery of his position. The puzzlement and lost feeling that reclaimed him instantly should be able to allow himself to wonder it as to how he could get back into his own life and time was reawakened by the something he heard in Mr. Wicker's voice. The tears gathered in his throat, and he had to swallow and cough several times before he would reply with any degree of clearness. Feel? Well, all right, I guess, in a way. But there's a sort of spitting in my head and my stomach if I try to figure any of this out. I just don't get it. He shook his head dubiously. I feel alive all right, and the food tasted good just now, but how in the world can all the changes come about or be? And there's something I should see to at home. All at once he needed desperately to know how his mother was that morning. He stood up abruptly. If I can just go now, please, Chris asked politely but firmly. It's been very interesting, but I... His throat tightened up again, and he made a helpless gesture with his hand and looked out of the window, wondering if he could jump out into the flower beds and be off. Mr. Wicker's voice, soft but with such authority that one did not question it, came again, and it had a healing in its sound. Sit down, Christopher, my lad, he said. And his eyes were kind, intent, and eager. We have much to talk of, you and I. But first, your mind and heart shall be put at ease. Do you know who I am? Restive and anxious to be off, Chris nonetheless found it necessary to reply. You still own stuff. That's all I know, he answered, beginning to feel a trifle surly. Mr. Wicker nodded, tapping his fingers together. Yes, he agreed. I sell old things. In your time... But now, in this time, what do you know of me? As he spoke, there was a change of tone, as if a younger man was speaking, and in spite of his impatience to get home, Chris looked up sharply. Mr. Wicker was leaning forward, and Chris felt himself unmovable under the vigor of those dark eyes. Nothing, sir, he heard himself saying, not taking his eyes from those of the man before him. I am a ship owner, Christopher, for one thing. Mr. Wicker drew a short breath. A merchant trading in tobacco, cotton, corn, and flour. But I am also... He paused, as if to give Chris a time to hear each word. I am also quite a fine magician, said Mr. Wicker. Chris leaned back, disappointed and scornful. Rabbits out of hats? He inquired. No, young man. Mr. Wicker answered with no show of annoyance. Not rabbits out of hats. That is, as you would say, is for toddlers. Suppose I prove to you just how good. Go ahead, said Chris, whose only thought was still to get home, but who admitted to himself a faint stir of curiosity. What closely, then, commanded Mr. Wicker. I have been in my twentieth century shaped so that you would recognize me. Now I shall regain my appearance of... This time, not a great change, I grant you, but there shall will be a difference. Watch me closely. Creasingly slinging forward in his chair, the room was well lit from three sides. Sunlight and firelight mingled to wash Mr. Wicker in their jointed apricot glow. Added to this, the two chairs, Triss's and Mr. Wicker's, were not more than three, four feet apart. Chris hunched forward yet a little more or to lessen the space and watch for any movement, however swift and swift. He'd seen magicians before, he told himself. But what he saw was so amazing that Cripps' lips parted in astonishment and his eyes stared unblinkingly. For the tiny figure of the old man before him, wizened with age and wrinkled but vast belief, before his eyes shook off not ten or twenty years, but one hundred and fifty it left him, while not a young man, middle-aged and vi aged, a vigorous man of forty years. The face was smoothed out and firm. Thick chestnut hair was caught back with a blue ribbon bow. Dark eyebrows were level above the steady eyes. 
I don't believe it! Chris breathed. You looked almost like a mummy before. And now... Mr. Wicker rose from his chair, and now he stood six feet, no longer wizened, no longer feeble. Fascinating, is it not? He remarked with a sardonic smile. A good trick, do you not agree? Chris look, sat looking at him, amazed but still incredulous. Well, yes, he admitted, but maybe with makeup or something. Ah, said Mr. Wicker, and his voice was deeper and more vigorous, too. Ah, then we shall try another. See if you can find me. And before Crickus's eyes, Mr. Wicker vanished into the thin air. Chris looked up, out, and got up. He looked under the table, there's under the table, behind the curtains, up the chimney, up the spiral staircase, out the windows. In short, everywhere and anywhere a man might hide, and in a great many places where it was impossible for him to be. Finally, he stood in the middle of the room. End of part one.